Well, hello everybody. Hopefully everyone is in. It's just after five, pardon the short delay as we got our technical things all under control. I just want to say hello to everybody. My name is Darren. I'm one of the marketing coordinators with the School of Health Sciences. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to BCIT's School of Health Sciences Information Session for the Electro <laughs> Neurophysiology Program, or uh, ENPY for short. It's easier on people's tongues. Before we get going, I just want to say how happy we are to see you and uh, thank you for attending our presentation today. Uh, I want to let everyone know to feel free to post uh, your questions, comments, and thoughts into the chat during the presentation. And we will address as many questions as we can near the end of the presentation in the Q&A segment. Uh, another thing is, if possible, please keep your microphone and video turned off until the end of the presentation just to reduce connectivity issues and interruptions and that will be greatly appreciated. Before we get going, I'm going to uh, let everyone know that BCIT acknowledges that our province of British Columbia is located on the homelands of 203 distinct indigenous nations and cultures with over 30 different languages and close to 60 unique dialects that are spoken in the province. We ask all participants to reflect, acknowledge and honor in their own way, the first nation land for which we live, work, and play. So thank you all for that. This is our agenda for this evening. Uh, welcome and introductions. Then we'll do a quick poll. We'll watch the uh, electro neurophysiology video. And then I'll introduce you to the program head for presentation and program overviews, and then uh, program advising. And at the end, we'll do questions and answers for how many we have time for at the end. If Aaron, if it's possible, can you play the video? Yeah, exactly. Oh, hi. My name is Keith Anderson, Bachelor of Arts Technologist in Training. Are you a neuroscience nerd, a brainiac, crazy for the cranium? Then do we have a program for you? In the Electroneurophysiology program here at BCIT, you will be studying the central nervous system by learning how to perform electroencephalograms, or EEGs. You will not only receive lectures, but also hands-on experience and practice in your labs. be studying the peripheral nervous system and learning how to perform nerve conduction studies. Because of its smaller class size, the program gives instructors the time to help you one-on-one -on -one whenever you need, whether it be with class projects or technique in the lab. Small class size also helps you bond with your classmates, so even though the program may be hard, you can always find ways to have fun. Thank you, Aaron. That was very helpful and excellent. <laughs> I always forget about the ending on that one. That's great. Okay, thank you everybody for your patience with that. And uh, now I will introduce Chris Christy McIntosh, the program head. Please take it away, Christy. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Christy McIntosh. I'm uh, the program head for electroneurophysiology. I've been with the program um, actually for a little over 14 years now, and I actually graduated from this program um, many, many years ago. So uh, I like to think I've uh, seen lots of uh, development um, over the years with this program. Uh, next slide. Sorry, just a slight delay, sorry. <laughs> it's all good. So, um, Electroneurophysiology, ENPY. So we are one of only three specialized program of its kind in Canada. Uh, BCIT's electroneurophysiology uh, technologists, uh, are, sorry, our grads are highly sought after. Um, many of our graduates you can find um, in various hospitals across Canada. Um, in addition, we're only um, one of uh, we're the only English speaking program. The other two, um, one is uh, French speaking entirely and the other one is bilingual. Um, so uh, we are, our technologists are looked, um, people look for our technologists to, to work all across Canada. Um, so hospitals and healthcare clinics use trained technologists to operate a sophisticated um, electroneurodiagnostic testing equipment, um, both EEG and EMG. And since we're the only provider of ENPY training in BC, um, BCIT plays an integral part in facilitating these processes. Next slide, please. So here's a little fun fact for you. Um, it's not a new test. Uh, a lot of people um, wonder about this because we're not found in every single hospital. Um, we're a small technology, um, often um, found more at the tertiary centers. Um, so in fact, uh, Hans Berger, um, who lived between 1873 and 1941, he was um, a German psychiatrist and he recorded the first human EEGs in 1924. Uh, it's a well known that he actually did most of his um, experiments on his kids. So there's a, a little fact for you. Um, so our technology has been around for quite some time. Next slide, please. So um, a bunch of uh, facts about our program. We're a continuous 24 month program. Uh, we take in 10 students uh, every two years. Uh, this may be changing though. We're going to apply to take in yearly intake um, in, uh, soon. So we hope that goes well. But for now, we continue to take um, students in every two years. So the first year, um, you're at BCIT where you learn and apply foundational knowledge and theory. Um, we start in January, which I'll touch on in a, a second. Um, so in this first year, you will do a four week clinical practicum and that's actually going to be in August, um, mostly observation and doing some sort of introductory hands on. In year two, there's three online seminars um, that you do while you're completing your 40 weeks of clinical practicum in various hospitals across Canada. Next slide, please. So um, a little bit more about the clinical practicums. Um, so in total, as I said, uh, 40 plus four weeks of clinical practicum, 44 weeks of clinical experience, um, approximately 35 hours a week, just like regular lab hours. Uh, we use many sites across Canada, um, not just uh, the lower mainland, not just BC. Um, and uh, sorry, half of those clinical placements uh, must be outside of the lower mainland. So um, if uh, you're doing four clinical practicums, we just ask that you complete two of them outside of the lower mainland. Next slide, please. So what's the career outlook? Um, it's extremely optimistic for our graduates. Um, more ENPY technologists are required in this field. And again, it's a lot to do with um, how our uh, population is aging and um, a lot of the aging population requires more and more EEGs. All of our graduates for many years have easily found employment. It's a great field. Um, next slide, please. 
Our graduates have become technologists, chief technologists, department managers, instructors, um, researchers, equipment uh, sales representatives, and program managers. Next slide, please. So I'll now turn this over to um, our program advisor, Zara. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you, Christy. And good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Zara L. Ottman, and I am a program advisor at BCIT. I've been with the institution for almost a year now, and I work under full-time studies. Um, so under advising, we essentially answer any questions regarding the admissions process. Next slide, please. So I'll go over the entrance requirements for the program and you can find the entrance requirements online. Uh, when you look up the electroneurophysiology program, um, whether you're just looking up it up in the search bar or under the School of Health Sciences, if you go to the program page on the left hand side, you'll see some useful links. One of them is entrance requirements. And so the first entrance requirement is English and there's actually two English requirements. Um, one of them is two years of full-time education in an English-speaking country. If you don't have that, you can take an ass assessment to meet that requirement. The second requirement is English 12 or an equivalent at a minimum of 73%. Um, the next requirement is math. So we ask for pre-calculus 12 at a minimum of 67%. Um, you can also use foundations of math 12, but you'd have to have a minimum of 73%. Um, there's also some additional post-secondary education that is required. So six credits of human anatomy and physiology at BCIT. Uh, we have our course listed on the slide over here. It's BHSC 1200. Um, it's one course because it's essentially uh, the two courses combined into one. So it is, I think it's six or 6.5 credits offered at BCIT. If you've taken it at another institution, we do have a PDF uh, listed under the entrance requirements page that you can reference for equivalencies across other institutions. Um, we, you also need to have six credits of post-secondary physics that are geared towards students who are taking science, engineering, uh, or physics programs. Um, because the program is competitive, um, it's always good to exceed the requirements. So having a strong academic history, not just with the entrance requirements, but if you've taken any additional post-secondary, uploading any additional credentials or transcripts that you have demonstrating that. If you have any, um, any work experience or volunteer experience, it doesn't have to be um, in the field. It can be something as simple as customer service related. Uh, and then a good knowledge of the profession profession, having um, researched the profession and knowing what the program is about. Next slide, please. So the next intake is January 2022 and applications um, have opened on January 2nd and are being accepted, accepted until May 31st of this year. And um, some additional qualities to be successful in the program as well as the profession. Um, we recommend strong communication skills, uh, just being able to articulate yourself well, having the ability to work independently as well as working in a team. Um, being able to manage uh, your time and stress. So the program is two years full time uh, and it is uh, quite busy. So being able to do that as well as um, having good physical and mental health. Um, it's also good to be able to make decisions uh, with confidence and being able to solve problems on your own. Um, having additional characteristics such as computer literacy, 3D vis visualization, um, good being good with your hands and having good hand-eye coordination. Next slide, please. And so the application process is entirely online. So your first step would be to review the entrance requirements um, and making sure that you're submitting your application before the deadline of um, May 31st. So again, you can access the entrance requirements online under the entrance requirements link on the program page. Um, doing any upgrading in that if necessary. So um, if you um, have courses that don't fall within the required percentages, you can upgrade those courses, doing additional upgrading to strengthen your application as well. Um, collecting all your documents, so collecting your transcripts, uh, your additional documents, and co converting everything to a PDF copy. And then also completing the CASPER assessment. 
Um, for those of you that don't know what CASPER is, it's an online assessment and it assesses uh, characteristics. So um, they assess 12 areas and you're presented with a scenario and you have to describe how you would handle that scenario. When you create a CASPER account, there's actually a practice test that you can do and access. It's some of the re retired questions that they had in the past. And if you have more questions, I do recommend going to their website. It is hyperlinked under the entrance requirements. Um, and so you can look at their FAQ over there and you can also contact them. They do have an email. Um, as part of the entrance requirements, there's also a mandatory applicant questionnaire. So being very thorough with that, um, reflecting on what you want to put on there um, and submitting that and demonstrating uh, your written skills on that as well. So your application will be submitted online again. So you can apply at bcit.ca slash apply, or you can actually apply directly from the program page. It'll be um, at the top where there's the banner. There's an apply now link. And so after you apply, um, the department will shortlist applicants after the application deadline of May 31st. And shortlisted applicants are invited to attend uh, an interview, which will, I think, likely be online this year. Um, and then the department will make a final decision. And it will take four, um, four to six weeks after the application deadline to hear back uh, regarding your status of your application. Next slide, please. So if you do become a student at BCIT, we do have tons of resources for you as well. So we have our BCIT Student Life Office, as well as our BCIT Student Association. Um, so they both follow the eight dimensions model. The eight dimensions are listed on the slide for you. And these are areas that they've identified that help students um, throughout their academics. So th they provide supports and resources in each area of this model. Um, they also uh, work towards helping students. Um, an example is during COVID-19, the ca campus, um, the Burnaby campus, and actually all campuses were closed and a lot of students um, wanted to take some study spaces on campus because a lot of students don't have access to that at home. Um, so the BCIT Student Association implemented three study spaces on campus and they um, followed the COVID protocols. They are sanitized between each use and there's barriers between them. If you want to find out, um, Actually, there's also a lot of great resources as well on campus. So there's our recreation services department. So they've got a physical gym and some studio spaces at the Burnaby campus. Right now they're doing virtual workouts and an eSport league. Um, there's financial aid and awards. So we had a question about tuition, which uh, we'll address at the end during the Q&A portion. Um, you can connect with financial aid and awards for information regarding student loans, bursaries, scholarships. Um, there's also counseling and student development, as well as uh, BCIT Student Health Services. So they um, have a clinic only for students. Right now they're doing phone and virtual appointments. And for more information, you can check out bcit.ca slash student services, or if you just go to bcit.ca, you'll see student services at the top. You can click on that and uh, you'll see all the services listed there for you. Next slide, please. So yeah, these are just some of the um, services that I mentioned. So student health services, counseling and development. Uh, we also have uh, indigenous services. So if you're indigenous, they can provide inf uh, clarification on indigenous funding. There's also accessibility services. So if you're someone with a permanent or temporary disability, you can connect with them to see if any accommodation can be made within the program. Next slide, please. So if you have any questions after today, I do recommend connecting with us at Program Advising. So you can give us a call Monday to Friday as indicated. You can also email us your inquiry or you can request a virtual Zoom appointment. You do this by emailing us at the same email address. So it's program underscore advising at bcit.ca. For the most up-to-date information regarding our service hours and any office closures, please check out our website, bcit.ca slash advising. Next slide, please. 
So I strongly encourage you to check out our Instagram handles. Um, so on Facebook and Instagram, there's lots of great posts. So there's um, updates about the institution. There's also some program specific videos. There's some testimonials on there. There's some, um, you know, mini videos and posts related to health sciences. Um, so if you want to, one of the more recent posts um, is the building of the Health Science Center at uh, the BCIT Burnaby campus, so you can check that out and see how it's going along. Um, there's also our YouTube channel with tons of great resources. Previous information sessions are listed on there. If you're also curious as to how our health science programs have been running um, during COVID-19, there is a video uploaded on there. So it talks about the protocols that the institution and the areas have taken, as well as some new technologies that we've implemented um, as a result of the pandemic. And uh, of course, you can also check out some more information about upcoming information sessions um, and uh, big info, which is coming up in a few weeks. Next slide, please. And we'll move on to the Q&A portion of our presentation. Hi, everyone. I got a couple of questions. It's Julie. I, I don't know what happened. I turned off my camera. Now it doesn't. I'm faceless now. So anyhow, Dan has asked if um, how long is the program and what is the price? So um, the program is two years full time, so 24 months full time. And then the price, I have the tuition and fees page uh, that I'll send you. It's a PDF and it breaks down uh, the tuition and fees. It's um, just over 3,800 um, for the levels. And then for your practicum, it's just under $2,000. And I'll link that in the chat. Um, in addition to that, uh, the tuition fees doesn't actually cover the UPAS fees or additional books and supplies. So th those will be additional costs. And tuition fees are subject to a 2% increase per year. Thank you, Zara. Um, I have another question from for Christy from Mary. Are EEGs and EMGs the only tests that an ENPY tech will perform? That was a lot. Would you be able to go into more detail on what those tests entail? Hi, sure, that's a, a great question. So uh, for our graduates, uh, the majority of our graduates will find employment doing EEG. Um, and in electroneurophysiology, that is where most of the jobs are. So that sort of the, that reflects that. Um, our graduates also uh, are taught how to do EMG. And so some of our graduates will go into jobs that do EMG as well. Um, and finally, we also uh, teach our technologists how to do what's called evoke potentials, um, and uh, which are not done quite as frequently. And finally, um, we give them a little bit of exposure um, to polysomnography, which is called uh, otherwise known as sleep studies. Um, the majority of our, our students we find just don't end up going up, going into um, polysomnography, uh, probably because the shifts are um, night shifts and that's maybe just not as appealing to some people. Um, however, uh, within each um, modality, EEG and EMG, et cetera, there are a few variations. Now, some students will, or pardon me, graduates will go on to work um, at a community hospital and they'll be more likely actually to do all of the modalities. Um, at a tertiary center, you might find that there's a department that has EEG and then there's another department that has um, electromyography. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a little bit of splitting that way. Um, also within EEG, um, some hospitals have what's called interoperative monitoring. So that's where um, the graduate, the EEG technologist goes and does um, monitoring using EEGs and evoke potentials um, in the operating room. So there, there is a little bit of variation um, is basically what I'm saying, even within those modalities. Um, so again, an EEG is where uh, you're looking at the, the brain waves. Um, primarily looking for uh, seizure activity. EMG is where you're looking at the peripheral nervous system and evoke potentials is where you're looking for uh, the integrity of the entire nervous system from as it continues from the peripheral nervous system and connects to uh, the central nervous system. 
So I hope that helps and uh, feel free to email me if you have any more questions regarding that. That's all I see for questions. Um, unless anybody wants to just unmute themselves and ask. Um, can I make a comment actually uh, about uh, our our window for applying? Um, so our deadline is uh, May 31st. Um, we will be interviewing applicants during the month of June. Um, and then uh, we hope to have final decisions by the beginning of July. Um, so, you know, it helps you guys to know what you want to do, to plan where you're going to be spending, um, you know, the, the winter. Um, we understand that everybody needs to make decisions um, and, uh, you know, plan for where they're going to be January 2022. Um, it's a fantastic program. Uh, we're highly sought after, like I said. Um, our students are always employed um, uh, and, and people just have nothing but great things to say about our program. It was an absolute thrill for me to be able to come back um, to the program having um, graduated from the program many years prior. So I highly encourage you to you know, get in touch with us, um, ask us what it's about. Um, I, I'm more than happy to speak with um, people uh, over Zoom. Um, and uh, hopefully one day when the world opens up a little bit, uh, you know, I'd be happy to show you the lab um, in the future. Uh, but uh, please consider our program. It, it really is um, a, a great field to be in. And I'm pretty sure that everybody that works in it now knows that that was an absolute, you know, super decision that they made to stay with the field. So thank you. We have one last question in the chat from Mary to everyone. Would the next application process be in 2023? Uh, so the application process wouldn't be in 2023. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, that would be, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so the next application process would be January, early January till, um, the end of May, uh, May 31st, uh, 2023. Um, and that's assuming that our next cohort is January, 2024. Um, however, if we are able to, you know, change to yearly intake, like I, you know, briefly touched on, um, our admission, our next, our next admissions window would be a year earlier. Um, so it would be a year from now um, if we went to uh, January 2022, January 2023, um, then we'd have an admissions window every year. Um, hope that explains um, how we, uh, so for now, you're, you're correct, but uh, we're hoping actually to get back to your intake. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Christy and Zara and Julie, and of course, Aaron. I uh, really appreciate that. If there's no other questions, we could definitely wrap this up. Just give anyone a second in case they think of something. But if you think of something uh, afterwards, or if you didn't want to ask it in this type of um, public, you can uh, certainly send an email to Christy with her email address up on the screen. Uh, if it's course related or program related, and of course, uh, program underscore advising at bcip.ca, if it's more admissions questions, it would be more than happy to answer that. Yeah, we can set up an appointment actually to, to talk over Zoom too, if, if that uh, works for you. I'm more than happy uh, to do that, um, not just to talk about the program, but also, you know, to talk about, you know, are you a fit? So uh, stuff like that. Let's show that last video. Yeah, if you can do that, I will quit sharing my screen. Excellent. Are you ready?
here at BCIT, we have 32 programs in the School of Health Sciences. They range anywhere from specialty nursing, bachelor of nursing, diagnostics, lab, and allied health programs. We are very unique in that we have one of the largest simulation labs in Western Canada. So the learning model prior to the pivot to online learning, it was primarily learners coming on campus to get that foundational knowledge through lectures or group activities. And then they would still have their labs and the experiential learning aspect of it. What we're doing now is more of a blended approach so that uh, instructors can put their lectures online and uh, they can also put group activities online as well. They still need to come on campus to do some of those hands-on components, but we are seeing more of a blended approach. We've really worked hard to make sure that the students get the experience that they deserve, that it meets the learning outcomes and the competencies of the program. The only difference is that we've uh, spread things out a little bit further and sometimes their class sizes are a little bit smaller. But other than that, they're getting the same experiential learning opportunities as always. So we've heard uh, our students say their experience of coming on campus for these simulation labs, they have felt very safe. We've even had students say that they feel safer coming onto campus than they do going into their own local grocery store. And I think that's due to all the organization, the time that we spent over the summer with occupational health and safety. We've marked the hallways with arrows indicating the direction so that we can control the flow, marking the floors so that they know exactly where they need to stand, and the scheduling too so that we don't have all of the students on campus at the same time they go to the specific bedside that they have been instructed to do so, and then the instructor is ready to start the simulation. In some cases, we actually have them in the back of the room and using a technology called an ELMO, the instructor can be much further away and can actually do a demonstration for all students to see. They don't have to be right next to them. So if a student ever needs an instructor to step in closer to assist, then the instructor with the proper PPE steps in does that assistance and then steps away again. In many cases, faculty will be wearing PPE all day, and that's due to the frequent need to move close to the students to assist them in the lab. And then once the students have completed their simulation experience, then they immediately leave the campus and they can continue on their day. Some of the other unique methods that we've employed is that instead of the students actually coming on campus for a simulated experience, we've shipped some equipment to them. Now, it's just small pieces of equipment. They actually ran a home-based simulation using family members or people within their bubble, and then they ship that equipment back to us. We have a highly interactive web-based virtual simulation program that we use, and the learners can interact with 3D avatar patients. And this, we found that it really reduces the amount of time that they come on campus because they hit the ground running when they come to the simulation lab. The students really enjoyed some of these activities that were really just supposed to be a temporary fix. Um, they really want that to continue as part of the program. Uh, so we will continue to do that. We're all looking for creative solutions to continue the experiential learning opportunities that BCIT is known for. And so it's really exciting to see that not only in our programs in the School of Health Sciences, uh, we see that collaboration, but we're seeing this collaboration across the entire campus. So it's an amazing thing to see and experience. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you all very much for joining us today. I should let you all know that a copy of the presentation will be sent out to all register, registrants uh, later on this week. And there's also more info sessions all week. So if you feel like uh, something else you're interested in, please sign up for another info session. We look forward to seeing you there. And uh, thank you all for being with us today. And we wish you all the best in your future in health sciences. Thank you so much.